Okay, so we have the uh, great honor this morning. I'm, I'm Lally Weymouth, uh, the Senior Associate Editor of the Washington Post, and we have the great honor at the Council to have with us this morning the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Frederica Mogherini, Perfect. am I saying it right? <laughs> uh, who's just been, if you can believe it, to London last night for the uh, core group meeting on Syria and flown all the way back, because this is her first U.S. visit. And so I'm going to chat with her a bit and then you're going to ask questions, of course, as usual. So, Minister, how, how has your trip gone and what is the highlights of your talk with Secretary Kerry and, and Susan Rice and other U.S. officials? Uh, it was, uh, first of all, it was very important for us to have uh, the first official bilateral visit here in the U.S. to show uh, how deep and special our relationship is. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, it was also a way of uh, following up the visit that uh, Secretary Kerry paid in March. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, him uh, in Rome in the occasion of uh, an international meeting on Libya. Uh, and uh, then the President uh, Obama that was visiting Rome uh, last month. That was very important for Italy. I think that was also important for our relations and it's very important for me to be uh, here as my first visit even if now. I'm quite confused on what stage of the visit I am because I was in Washington, then flying to London, and then come back to, to New York uh, yesterday night. Um, we discussed of the main uh, uh, international uh, challenges we have uh, in front of us uh, in these weeks and months. Uh, Ukraine is the big topic on the agenda, as uh, for all of you, uh, I think is quite uh, evident. Um, we have worked together very well from the very beginning. Thank you very much. Um, on speaking with one voice and coordinating actions and reactions mm -hmm. on both sides of the Atlantic and within the European Union uh, and within the G7. Uh, and I think that was extremely important to uh, send a strong uh, sign to uh, Russia and also to Ukraine uh, that uh, break of international principles cannot uh, uh, be ignored and there is a strong and united international reaction to that. And then we also discussed... But, um, People say uh, that the United States would like to impose sectoral sanctions on Russia, stronger sanctions than the Europeans would like to impose. Would you say this is correct? Are the Europeans um, dragging their feet, especially the Germans? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I think that from the very beginning we said clearly that uh, sanctions are an instrument, are a tool mm -hmm. for making political pressure uh, on Russia mm -hmm. uh, to have Russia going back to play a responsible international role. Mm -hmm. Um, sanctions are not the objective themselves. They are an instrument, they are a tool. As we say, the only way uh, we have to solve the crisis is the political way, is the political dialogue within Ukraine and between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, we need to have instruments to force the parts to do that. And sanctions are probably one of the most relevant uh, tools we have. Uh, so the matter is uh, how we balance uh, the tools we have. National dialogue, mm -hmm. Uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, the national uh, roundtable started, mm -hmm. organized by uh, the OSCE, that is playing a very important role uh, in this uh, phase, um, and going on at the same time with preparing the third phase of the sanctions. This is something that the European Union is also doing um, in parallel with the US. But isn't the European Union dragging its feet in, on imposing sectoral sanctions, hard, harder sanctions that are already so imposed? Far, so far, the European Union and the US have, Im have imposed the same kind of sanctions mm -hmm. to a similar uh, list of people. Uh, so we are actually uh, coordinating uh, the speed uh, and the level of our uh, action uh, in order to have that uh, going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's quite more complicated for 28 countries mm -hmm to decide together what kind of sanctions, uh, the sectorial sanctions uh, to, to have. Uh, because we say and we have decided that uh, uh, in any case the third stage of sanctions, if we get there, said that our objective is not to get there uh, right. because there might not be the need for going there. Uh, in any case, the third phase of sanctions has to be balanced in terms of burden sharing among the different European countries. And as you know, uh, some of us uh, have uh, stronger uh, relations with Russia in the field of energy, others in the field of defense, others in the financial field. So we have to prepare technically our set of sanctions in a much more complicated way, probably. Yeah. But the real point is that now we are, while preparing that on the technical level, and we're ready to adopt them if needed, 
we have now the big chance of concentrating ourselves on facilitating the dialogue so that the elections can take place and be a success because our aim is making elections a success and when i was in kiev that. about a week ago um, the general view was that uh, that mr putin's strategy the russian strategy was to be sure that the elections did not take place do you agree with that do no you th- how I do you see his strategy w- when was that three weeks ago mm-hmm. two weeks ago maybe. two weeks ago you, you see uh one point of this crisis is that um, things change quite rapidly on the ground mm-hmm. uh, and the political uh, framework. Um, my impression uh, from the talks we've had also yesterday with my uh, European and American colleague, uh, we also had a little bit of an update on Ukraine. Uh, Steinmeier was just back from, uh, uh, not only from Kiev, but also he visited the south mm-hmm. of Ukraine. And uh, uh, we have direct contact with the USC uh, basically every day on the situation on the ground is that at the moment uh, the, n- the national dialogue even if very difficult is going on is starting uh, that elections might uh, successfully take place mm-hmm. uh, probably possibly uh, in all regions even if that is still question mark mm-hmm. um, and the point is working on the ground to make it possible uh, we still have one week and one week in Ukrainian times for now, <laughs> it's a long, oh long God. time. Uh, things can go for much better or, or can go much worse. But we're working, the point now is working for making the elections happen, making them a success, and together with that, proceed, help the Ukrainians proceed on uh, the institutional reforms. That is also important. You said that you flew to London yesterday, you told our audience, uh, to um, attend the core group, uh, on which works on Syria, of course. So can you tell us how, uh, what happened yesterday? Is Assad just going to be re-elected in the election that he seems to have um, proposed to uh, um, make himself? I don't know how you would put it more delicately. Yeah. Um, uh, do you, do you, uh, what do you think of the situation in Syria? Could it have been prevented? Do you think the United States should have acted more forcefully? Do you think the international community should have acted more forcefully? First of all, I think it was good we had a meeting yesterday in London because uh, one of the risks we have is that Ukraine shadows all the rest, Mm -hmm. while conflicts are still open around the world, and especially in the Middle East and in the Mediterranean. Uh, So it was good to have the meeting. It was good to show commitment to uh, face the situation that that seems to be... uh, not really developing in any kind of positive way. The Out of the three processes, the political uh, solution or the political dialogue mm-hmm. uh, out of Geneva uh, process, the humanitarian assistance and the elimination of the chemical weapons, mm-hmm. that is the, the last one, the elimination of the chemical weapons seems the only one that is going on quite well. Mm-hmm. We're missing now uh, an 8%, 7 8% of the chemical weapons uh, elements uh, to be uh, eliminated, and we are doing that uh, in Italy, uh, in in, uh, in the port of Gioia Tauro, and expect to do so in the coming weeks. Uh, but the other two, humanitarian uh, assistance and the political dialogue, are completely blocked. Uh, Brahimi resigned. Uh, so the meeting yesterday was to say, first of all, that we stay committed to face the situation. We do not recognize any kind of uh, legitimacy to elections mm-hmm. that have a double uh, serious uh, element of concern. On one side, you have elections in a country that is clearly at war mm-hmm. uh, with the clear will of excluding a large part of the population from voting. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, so there is a, an element of a paradox there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a more serious thing, which is that that is a break of the Geneva agreements because Mm -hmm. the agreement uh, was that uh, there was going to be a sort of transitional government and no election. So there is a double uh, element of worry. Then we agreed on other things like, uh, for instance, the uh, deference to the International Criminal Court Mm -hmm. of the situation here in the UN. Uh, Here in the UN, again, uh, the the effort to pass um, a resolution on humanitarian assistance on cross-border operations and the support to the, um, to the opposition forces uh, in ways that we'll have still to discuss and agree on, but there was an effort to, we also had a meeting with them. But that was a with sort the of- opposition pack- forces. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that was a sort of package uh, and an agreement to go on working in the coming days and weeks to see how to develop it further, uh, to say that 
we are still committed to deal with the situation. I don't think, uh, as you asked, I'm going to answer, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, a military reaction or a stronger reaction uh, some time ago would have uh, made the situation better. Um, because that is, I think, um, and I have some doubts on the fact that uh, that can be a right approach. I have the impression that we decided together to follow the political track mm -hmm. with the Geneva process. I think that we have to stick to the fact, and, and, and I've seen the declarations of, uh, by, by uh, the statements by uh, Kerry uh, yesterday in London to the press that we're going more or less in the same direction, saying that um, we have to stick to the fact that we need a political dialogue to solve the crisis. The point is, uh, is always the same. How do you force political dialogue to take place? But Mr. Assad did, doesn't seem interested at all in any political dialogue, right? I think the key element there is involving more and more the regional actors. Um, Syria is a country that has uh, complicated links to many neighbors, uh, for good or for bad, mm -hmm. mainly for bad at the moment. Uh, I think uh, we should make an effort to see, for instance, uh, if uh, while we go on uh, in defining a definitive deal on uh, the Iranian nuclear mm -hmm. uh, issue, uh, we might have a way of saying to Iran, uh, well, try also to play a positive role or at least not a negative role in the Syria uh, conflict and, and make it, uh, make it uh, a broader, a little bit of a broader discussion not conditioning one to, without, to the other, but I think that also the other countries in the region, even the Gulf, uh, you said, you, you've seen probably that there is this, uh, this new tendency or this news, maybe, of a meeting of the foreign ministers of um, Saudi Arabia and Iran. That would be a game changer, probably. That yeah. was amazing. It was. What it did was. you think of that, Minister? I think that was a change, probably a game changer, if it happens. And I think that means that... Uh, you know, countries in the region are much more realistic and pragmatic and ready to be uh, flexible in the ways they have to deal with the crisis around them because it's in their interest. Um, but do you think it meant actually that Saudi Arabia thinks the West won't do anything about the Iranian nuclear program so they have no choice but to get along with their own? No. I think, uh, I think they are, uh, maybe, <coughs> but you should ask them, uh, I think they are uh, maybe ready to test if Iran, as long as it goes on with uh, the nuclear agreement that mm -hmm. is in discussion these days in Vienna, mm -hmm. seems to be quite well, uh, if that could also be, uh, let's say, bring some change of attitude uh, in the region. I'm not saying they're becoming friends, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm saying that they might get to a point where they share an interest in the stability of the region. Uh, let me uh, give you an example uh, that refers to the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, 100 years ago, uh, we were starting the First World War. Yeah. Um, now we are thinking it's basically impossible to be at war between European countries, among European countries. What, did, uh, what was the element that made the European Union process a success? Not that suddenly we liked each other so much. Mm -hmm. It's just that we started to share an interest. Mm -hmm. It started with the economic mm -hmm. um, uh, community. Uh, I think that sharing an interest and seeing uh, the win-win situations you can work on mm -hmm. could develop different uh, relations mm -hmm. in the areas uh, that are concerned by these trends. Uh, it might be that in the Middle East, something like that could be wise to develop at a certain point. And it might be that the regional actors realize that before we do. I'm an optimist, as you say. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, so you ha the um, rumor is that the Iran uh, deal will be done by the end of July. Mm -hmm. What do you, are you optimistic about the yeah. Iran deal? What, how do you, what do you think of the interim deal? What do you hope for in the final deal? I think, uh, well, uh, as you know, Italy is not in the negotiation, but we have um, obviously our links through the European mm -hmm. Union and uh, uh, directly to Iran, you know that uh, the, uh, at the time Italian foreign minister was the first mm -hmm. to visit Iran officially after the election of Rouhani last December, if, I was not, if I'm not wrong, and I would have done the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, the approach of engaging uh, 
actors uh, that have an influence in conflicts mm -hmm. um, is always uh, an attempt that is uh, wise to at least try. Mm -hmm. um, not being naive. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I mean, uh, the nuclear uh, program is not an element of uh, discussion. Uh, I think the negotiations are going quite well, as far as I know, from, from Katie Ashton and, and from and from the others. Uh, I think they are quite optimistic on the possibility of reaching a definitive agreement by July. And I think that would be a very good and positive sign mm -hmm. uh, of the fact that we could engage Iran on different mm -hmm. dossiers, mm -hmm. if that goes well. Obviously, there's no, uh, there's no deal that can be done uh, nuclear in exchange of something else. The nuclear issue is, is definitely uh, to, be, uh, to be settled uh, as a priority, and there is no way that Iran can and should have any kind of nuclear uh, yeah. military facilities. That's that's for sure. But if they manage to get to an agreement, a definitive agreement that is positive, uh, I think we should also test their willingness and their readiness and their capacity uh, to become uh, a responsible regional actor, mm -hmm. and that might be in the interest of the region itself. Mm -hmm. I know that um, oil and gas from Russia are a big um, topic in Europe, yeah. and of course it's one reason that the Europeans are hesitant to impose heavier sanctions upon Russia. And apparently much of your oil and gas, some of it comes from Libya, am yeah. I correct? Yeah, so how do, you, how do you see the situation in Libya? I interviewed the last uh, Prime Minister, the poor thing, who was uh, in Paris. I, he'd been kidnapped from his hotel room and then of course, now he's been ousted, and there's a new prime minister, and basically there are all these groups fighting, as far as I can see. Yeah. Th uh, first of all, the situation in Libya is of concern uh, mm. regardless of, of gas. Uh, there is also a gas issue, but yeah. as in Ukraine, uh, the main concern is not the economic one. Uh, again, I'm, I'm a strong believer of the fact that the uh, situation of human rights mm. and the situation of uh, the people on the ground uh, comes mm. first. Mm. Um, call it naive, but I think uh, I think that is uh, has to be the basis for our, mm. for our policy to solve in the conflicts. Uh, in Libya at the moment, there is an extremely difficult uh, situation. Um, okay. Fragmentation, lack of institutions uh, that has ever been there. Uh, even when Gaddafi was there, the state was not there. It was just something that covered the fact yeah. that the state was not there. Uh, and we cannot expect, I think, realistically, uh, that... Uh, country builds institutions in a very complicated situation with the quantity of arms that is the equivalent of the arms that are present in Iraq and Afghanistan together mm -hmm. in a country with a much smaller yeah. population. Uh, so I think we cannot expect them to do that w kind of work on institution buildings, mm -hmm. control of the territory, control of the land borders, the sea borders, uh, and the oil uh, production uh, from one day to the other. Mm -hmm. The point is are they engaged in uh, a process, an internal process, that can lead them there? And is the international community ready to help and to support this process mm -hmm. when it happens? Um, I think that is the point. Now we are in a situation that is extremely fluid. Uh, we have at the moment a nominated new prime minister and still the old prime minister uh, transitionally in place. Mm -hmm. The new government has not been presented yet. Mm -hmm. Might happen on Sunday in front of the Congress uh, in Libya. Is it going to uh, pass? Is it not going to pass? Mm -hmm. Depends on them. Uh, in the meantime, uh, yeah, the situation on the ground is uh, is uh, in terms of security is not uh, is not easy. The only thing that I think we can uh, really do uh, is telling the Libyans themselves that they have. Mm -hmm to be committed to a national reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. There is no alternative to that. Uh, and then once they start to do mm -hmm. it, uh, support them strongly. strongly mm -hmm. So now can I turn the meeting over to our members? And do you, do you want? would you like to ask some questions of the minister? Nina Gardner, I'm a consultant to uh, on sustainability to NL and the adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins Sites in Washington on business and human rights. First, I want to say uh, what a great uh, signal this is for a uh, new and young uh, Italian government to have uh, a young and uh, obviously very competent uh, foreign minister with us on our first visit. It really shows that something is changing in Italy, and we're very proud. Yeah. <laughs>
a tutti quanti. <laughs> Not to mention perfect English. So, um, my question is about uh, forward things. There's some of the big um, appointments and events you have uh, coming up in 2015. So I want to move away from the security issue, which is your specialty, I know, but to um, the expo that's uh, happening in Italy, um, which is on food security, feeding the planet and energy. Um, and of course, the COP21, the uh, climate change conference in Paris as well at the end of next year. Um, what are the priorities that you see as foreign minister and what will you be trying to um, push? Because in fact, being a, a young generation foreign minister, you, we're all seeing this as something that is gonna impact uh, those of us who are younger, our, our lives and of course our children's lives. And so I'm just wondering whether um, you have some priorities that you wanna make sure happen um, under your, um, uh, when you're there. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, thank you for, uh, not only for the nice words in the beginning, but also for uh, considering natural that I will be still there at the end of next yeah, week, which absolutely. is something great for an Italian <laughs> minister. Thank you very much. No, that is a joke. <laughs> um, on Expo, um, no, I'll start from the climate change. Uh, I, uh, we talked about that with uh, Laurent Fabius, that I, th I know uh, he was in, uh, probably not here, but in Washington a couple of days before me, and we were in London together yesterday. And he was traveling, I was traveling back here, and he was traveling to China to discuss climate change which I guess is uh, probably the, the most, one of the most difficult countries uh, to discuss climate change with, but it means that we are already preparing uh, on, in terms of the political outcome, because I think that we cannot uh, afford having um, a conference that uh, is not a success on climate change uh, in, in Paris next, uh, next year. Yeah. Um, and I think that is true uh, not only for climate change in itself, but also for the links uh, with energy. Uh, I think we have to be very much aware of that uh, and uh, on the European side we're trying to push and we will use our presidency to push forward this, uh, this topic in the agenda. Uh, and uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Minister Federica Guidi, we have two Federica in, min in the government, which is uh, for sure never happened in, in Italian history. It's, a very, uh, it's not a very common name. Uh, she's already working on that, uh, on the side of the uh, next Italian EU presidency of the European Union to make sure that the European Union gives, uh, gives a united contribution to that kind of success. And we know that is a, that is a key. On Expo, um, my particular point on the agenda for Expo uh, is underlining, uh, and I'm working on that, is underlining the political relevance of the issue, of the theme of Expo, which is, as you said, feeding the planet that gives us the great opportunity to tackle the post-2015 uh, uh, Millennium Development Goals agenda. There is a development uh, uh, policy issue there, the contradiction between the fact that uh, half of the population is eating too much, half of the population is eating too little uh, in the world. Uh, are we able together globally, uh, together with the UN system, to face this uh, problem? I know that, well, the, as you know, the UN uh, agencies in Rome are uh, the one targeted to uh, food and food security and uh, agriculture. And to these issues, we are involving them in the preparation of the content of Expo 2015. Uh, we will use the Food Day, the World Food Day, 16 of October this year, and then the following one to make it relevant also with the campaign. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that um, during, my, uh, uh, during the previous days, uh, in the beginning of the week in Washington, uh, we would be uh, honored uh, if the United States that will have a pavilion in Milan Expo uh, 2015 uh, could have some involvement of Michelle Obama that uh, we know is very committed to the issue of uh, um, sustainability. sustainability and also um, food and nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, the two elements are very strongly linked uh, and it would be, I think, a very powerful message if we make public opinion worldwide aware of the contradiction we have. We are not lacking resources in terms of food and agriculture. We are lacking distribution of resources in that field. Hi, yes. Uh, I would also like to uh, compliment you on your presentation. And a little bit in follow-up to the last question, but the presentation, I'm sorry, the presentation was a tour de force on world politics, particularly Eurocentric world politics. Why don't you say something about, uh, is there a 
uh, a place where Italy will play a larger role than just as one member of the European Union, whether it's through the conferences or whether it's through um, bilateral work with some of the countries involved. In other words, uh, do you have any special plans or views for a role that, that Italy can play in the, the uh, affairs that you discussed uh, earlier? Um. Yes, well, Italy will have a, ro a special role uh, taking the presidency of the European Union, especially taking the presidency in a time of transition. Uh, 25th of uh, May, we were talking about that before coming in, 25th of May is quite symbolically uh, a date of elections uh, for the European Parliament in Ukraine and in Egypt, and I learned in Colombia as well. Uh, and uh, I think, th but these three uh, elements, uh, I think give us a triangle of, uh, of uh, special uh, role that uh, Italy, during the, especially during the semester of presidency, can play. Um, Brussels, Mediterranean, and the Eastern Partnership. Uh, there is the need for a European uh, foreign common approach in the area, both East and South. Uh, I know I'm staying within the European uh, part of the world, but I think that uh, there, there are parts of the world where Europeans have or can have a better understanding of the complexity of the situation uh, and so a much bigger added value uh, to uh, rather than other actors. And uh, if we don't do that, we're missing a historical opportunity. Look at the Mediterranean uh, or the Middle East. Uh, we could have seen conflicts or problems coming up before they became conflicts uh, if we had uh, a sort of focus on, on the region. Uh, but on the other side, um, and, uh, we, we, we shouldn't miss the opportunity uh, that is represented, for instance, by the next NATO summit in Wales in September to, uh, to develop the other elements. I'm okay, thinking about the partner global partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, is still Pivot to Asia an issue? here in, in the US? Because my impression is that uh, the crisis in Ukraine shadowed uh, our analysis of the last, uh, what, couple of years? Um, and, uh, and now we are risking to go back to um, a sentiment of uh, security issues or, or <coughs> stability is just concerning Russia. Mm -hmm. And the risk is that Russia pivots to Asia and to China, and we concentrate on, uh, on on, on a geopolitical uh, framework that maybe, hopefully, in one year time, is not there anymore, hopefully. Uh, and, and so I think we shouldn't miss the opportunity to rethink uh, our uh, strategic relations, our strategic partnership uh, in other areas of the world, Latin America, uh, the Far East Asia, I both in terms of security and in terms of economic growth and economic relations. Um, looking a little bit more ahead of what we have. And we will try to play a role in that uh, sense, both uh, as a country bilaterally and as, uh, as a presidency of the European Union. But I'm, I don't that's, know if that could... No, that's, that's wonderful. But as far as the pivot to Asia goes, each person in this room will give you a different answer. Mm -hmm. My answer is it has very little to do with Europe. It has to do with not being stuck in Southwest Asia and being able to turn our focus uh, east. Everybody else will give you something different. But it shouldn't be central to our relations uh, with Europe. No, I, in my personal opinion, but then we, I will close this pivot to Asia, but my personal opinion is that Europe is also interested in pivoting to Asia, and we can do that together. We're not jealous uh, of our transatlantic relations. I, I, think, I think we have a, a, a specific interest in doing that, uh, because the other continents, apart from our two, uh, um, relates to each other much more than we normally realize. And uh, there is a world out there that is going on, uh, plenty of opportunity and challenges, and we should tackle both, I think, uh, in a more uh, um, aware uh, way. So, next question. Good morning. Thank you for a great presentation. Rolfing Kuipers from Deutsche Bank. Um, my question is more concerning um, trends in Europe. Um, we see what's happening in the Ukraine, but we also have the Scottish referendum coming up, mm -hmm. potential cessation of Scotland from, uh, from Great Britain. And we also continue to see issues with the Catalans in Spain. 
there's always an issue around Belgium. Do you think that um, this is the beginning of a trend and that we could see more areas within Europe uh, wanting to become independent from the countries that they currently belong to? And what is Italy's view on this? You know, we've had uh, uh, a political movement for uh, quite some years that was also in government, uh, that was uh, um, asking, well, change its mind quite often, but either uh, to become part of something different, leave Italy, uh, then it was never more concrete than that. Uh, and uh, now is, I think, the uh, less, yeah, it's the smallest group in parliament, I would say. Um, I think we don't have a trend of fragmentation in Europe. I think we have a need for a different way of, um, of um, w organizing our uh, political and institutional system. German, uh, Germany is a federal country. Uh, and I think the answer to uh, this uh, aspiration to uh, control uh, local uh, policies more in a global world and in, in a European uh, integration uh, system uh, is uh, the degree of decentraliza decentralization and recognition of autonomies that uh, a central state manages to put in place. And that uh, tells us also a lot uh, about the crisis in Ukraine, for instance. Uh, I think uh, the smart way of dealing with these trends uh, is on one side saying very openly uh, that in this world we live in, uh, there is almost um, no real and serious and big issue that can be solved, not even at a national level. The, uh, in, in my perspective, the European level is the minimum uh, level to which we can give uh, real answers to our real problems. Uh, but then there are plenty of small things that happen on the local level and that not necessarily need to be tackled by the national government. Can be uh, can be an issue for, for local authorities that have more powers. Um, well, here in the United States also is a federal country and, and, and that's a lot of that. And that I know that the dynamic between the states and the single states and Washington is sometimes very hard. Uh, I think the process we're going through in Europe is similar to that. Not really a, 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 one, a willing to split, also because splitting for going where? Uh, we share the same destiny, we share the same interests and values, mm -hmm. uh, but rather uh, the need for reforming the, our institutional systems in terms of giving more powers to the local authorities and entities. Can I call on you? Uh, Kimball Chen, Energy Transportation Group. Minister, it's, uh, in, in, the re in the last decade, uh, Italy's um, philosophies of foreign policy and trade policy in regard to energy have been quite interesting. Forging under, under Mr. Berlusconi a somewhat special relationship with Russia. Um, what is the evolving view of Italy, or at least the view of Italy right now, the current government, uh, in regard to convergence of European energy policy and energy security policy? And what does that mean in terms of Italy's own national interests uh, as a transit state, potentially for new pipelines as well as existing pipelines, especially in the natural gas arena. This is a matter of great interest to many people. Yes, I think it was, uh, uh, in, in one sense, it's very good we started a real uh, and deep work on uh, uh, the European uh, strategy on energy. Uh, I think it was a shame it started only uh, after the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, we should have done it before. Um, I think uh, this might, uh, Italy, as you know, yes, has special uh, energy and not only energy, also commercial relations with Russia as well as many other European countries. We are not the ones that are more dependent mm -hmm. on Russia for gas, uh, but we are, let's say, an average, uh, more or less. But other European countries are completely uh, dependent on, uh, on Russia for, for energy. Uh, I think it's extremely wise to differentiate our uh, energy resources. It's of great importance to be uh, very realistic on uh, the level of stability of the countries on which we depend. Uh, as you said, we have Russia yeah. and Libya and Algeria, basically. So mm, 
it's good to differentiate, but then you also have to work on the country's uh, stability uh, because uh, you can differentiate uh, in 10 different countries and then if the 10 of them are quite unstable, you in any case have a problem. Um, I think we, I, I, I think so. It's a very positive step. We have, uh, we have work uh, developed now uh, on the European level. Uh, I think it was very good that there was uh, a request uh, to have a trilateral dialogue um, also with Moscow, uh, that the European Union as such has started, uh, I think that was one week ago and another meeting is going to take place in a, in a while. Uh, we hosted a G7 Energy in Rome one week ago because we think that also on the G7 uh, level we have to uh, work on that uh, more closely. Mm. Having said that, my impression, but I'm not a specialist uh, in energy, so I might, uh, I might uh, be wrong, but my impression is that energy, a little bit like investments for, uh, for defense, uh, takes quite some time to develop infrastructures and strategies that then bring a result. Uh, I think it's good to differentiate. I think we should be, while working at the next uh, phase of our energy supplies, think how the world will look like when they will be actually in place five years from now maybe or three years from now or ten years from now i don't know uh, because we risk to move the ship uh, that moves so slowly in another direction and then find out then uh, direction where we were before uh, in the meantime uh, works uh, so but this is not really um, this is not really to say that we shouldn't uh, work on uh, either a common European strategy or a common G7 strategy or to differentiate more, uh, but just to say that I don't think um, the times for, um, uh, for having uh, supplies also, also from the East in Europe is uh, definitely over. Also because my hope is that we, manage, we will manage uh, for the for, for, for the sake of Ukraine first, uh, to overcome the crisis and at a certain time to regain a certain partnership with Russia, both at the European Union level and with NATO. Hmm. But that is an issue itself, I know. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you commented uh, a little earlier uh, that in looking at these range of your foreign policy interests, Italy is uh, reviewing its relationships around the world, Asia, <laughs> South America, maybe North America, and uh, that raises the question of the United States, uh, your relationship with the United States, Europe's relationship with the United States, the extent to which the traditional leadership of the United States in foreign affairs uh, has been expected for the last 20 or 25 years, but that commentary now is that the U.S. Uh, consciously is giving up its leadership, uh, wishing to take a more cooperative or at least shared view of leadership. Uh, and my question is, to what extent um, has U.S. Uh, leadership um, in even NATO or throughout the European Union uh, with regard to considerations of Asia and Europe um, diminished uh, by reason of the U.S. withdrawal, if you want to put it that way, uh, from activity in uh, trying to lead the world in international affairs? Um. My impression, well, I, obviously I, I can hardly make the comparison uh, with how it was 20 years ago, if not from an historical point of view. Uh, my impression is that the United States are not uh, giving up a role, uh, but they are rather interpreting it in a different way. Uh, as you said, in a more uh, uh, shared or cooperational attitude uh, that I value uh, extremely positively. Uh, I think that the core of our transatlantic relations uh, is working together. Uh, and uh, as I said before, there are certain areas or certain fields or certain regions uh, where uh, Europe could have a better understanding of the situation 
on on the ground or or for different reasons uh, and it might be uh, better to work more on the european level in certain uh, dossiers and in other cases uh, the opposite i think i don't see a withdrawal of the United States from the international leadership. I see a different way, a different attitude in sharing this leadership, and I think it's uh, it's very appreciated. Uh, obviously, the point is, but this is my European perspective, uh, if Europe is uh, able to, uh, to respond to that in an appropriate way, this requires a European foreign policy and European defense policy also. Mm -hmm. Um, that requires European defense spending, doesn't it? Yes. Um, let me touch on that. Um, uh, can I be very open and frank? <laughs> I think that, uh, yes, there is an issue of the, n the quantity of uh, our sp defense spending. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, don't fool ourselves. Um, we could spend more. If we don't have, if we're not going to have a common foreign policy, we could spend even ten times more. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do anything with that. Anything. We need to share a vision of what we need to do in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we partially have it, not in all cases in Europe, not in all cases. Um, and uh, defense doesn't substitute uh, a foreign a foreign affairs approach. In addition to that. Um, in Italy, for instance, um, we spend 1.2, I think, 1.3, uh, so below the 2%. But the real point uh, for the Italian defense spending but mm. is not so much how much we spend, but how we spend. Because mm -hmm. we have an enormous amount of troops, mm -hmm. probably too many for a country like Italy, and we invest too little in technology mm. uh, or in training. So in my point of view, uh, but this is more a defense uh, minister uh, issue. But in my point of view, we, we discuss a lot on that. And we are doing a reform of the, uh, of the military system in Italy to rebalance the internal division of the budget for defense. Uh, we should invest in the smartest way the amount of money we already have for defense. Uh, and that was the process that was going on and still going on uh, in the NATO um, uh, way to the Wade Summit. Uh, this uh, smart defense approach. Uh, I think it might be quite critical to raise the defense budgets in the times of crisis, even if in times when we're getting out of the crisis, given the fact that Ukraine crisis doesn't affect our economic recovery, which is a question mark at the moment. Mm -hmm. but, but we can work on how we manage to spend in a more efficient way, mm -hmm. uh, because it's not really the input, it's, well, it's also the input, obviously. If you don't have quantity, you cannot uh, have quality. But given a certain quantity, you can work in improving the output mm -hmm. a lot. That's interesting. Mr. Chen mentioned earlier uh, Berlusconi's efforts to build up a special relationship with Russia. And Berlusconi himself often spoke of his personal close relations with Putin. Has the present government made any effort to enlist his help in uh, telling his pal to cool his jets? <laughs> First of all, uh, let me say that um, uh, I won't comment on Berlusconi, uh, uh, but I will say that Italy and Russia as two countries have relations, have special relations that are, as I said, uh, uh, well, special relations. We have special relations with uh, with many countries. Uh, let's say deep links in terms of economy, uh, trade, uh, energy, as we discussed, um, as many other European countries. And the relations are there country to country. Uh, as we say, w we would say in Italian, sistema uh, paese. I don't know how to translate that in English, but uh, so it's our business, it's our enterprises, is our, our firms working, uh, universities, whatever. Uh, there are links that go far beyond the political leaderships of countries. Um, the last Italian-Russian uh, bilateral summit was held in December in Trieste, uh, and the prime minister was Letta, uh, and the foreign minister was Emma Bonino. Um, so I think that goes beyond the persons that are in power, and I think it's good that we do not work on... Uh, uh, here we have a difference in attitude. Uh, 
relating to previous governments, uh, foreign policy and in particular relations, uh, international relations, do not depend on personal relations so much. They also they help, obviously. I mean, but it's country to country, it's institution to institution. Uh, it's not that we're friends. We are. We might also be friends, but uh, that is not the key element. The key element is uh, the national interest, uh, the common interest, the global interest, uh, and the institutional relations we manage to build. Um, th did that answer the question? No. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, can I call on you, please, Ken? What is you your opinion on the impact of the strong euro on your ability to compete in uh, exports? And are you supportive of the indication that Draghi, Draghi made uh, to significantly lower interest rates, and which will have a significant impact on lowering the uh, euro? Foreign Minister. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that would be a question for uh, my very good friend and, uh, and colleague, uh, uh, Piercarlo Padoan, that is uh, an extremely uh, good and wise uh, finance minister. Um, you know, we depend, uh, we depend, we work a lot on, on our experts. Uh, and we think that Draghi is making uh, an excellent job, has basically saved the Euro and the Eurozone during the crisis. Uh, I, I think uh, is uh, an extremely wise and competent person that is guiding us uh, very well out of this uh, uh, difficult years. And, uh, and we will discuss <laughs> within Europe, I think, the next steps. But I wouldn't say that we will discuss, uh, well, now it's only one week before the European elections. Uh, we will have to see after that uh, how, how the situation goes, but that is an issue on the table. Jim. Uh, Minister, thank, thank you <coughs> for uh, your very interesting remarks. Uh, I wonder whether you um, might uh, care to comment on uh, the role of women in Italian politics. <laughs> Obviously, you were uh, marvelous case in point. But apart from that, uh, do you believe that there is further progress to be made? And if so, in, in what areas? Yes. It um, was mentioned before, this is the first Italian government ever uh, that has uh, half women, half men. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that, it's also the youngest government of the Italian uh, Republic and history. Uh, and I would also uh, add to that, that uh, it has women in key positions. Uh, foreign uh, affairs, defense, uh, economic development and energy, uh, institutional reforms, uh, school and university and research, health and so on. Um, this doesn't mean that the work is done at all. Uh, on the contrary, this is a sign that we have wanted to give to uh, Italy. Um, and that was also an issue for debate. Uh, especially in my case, I think it was an issue of debate. Um, a part of the message, of the cultural message that this government has, uh, has wanted to give is that uh, um, it's normal to have women uh, in key positions uh, at the institutional level. And at the fact that at 40 you're not young, only in Italy you're considered <laughs> young at 40. Uh, so, um, but I think Italy has a problem, uh, has had a problem in politics, and we have had uh, a political responsibility uh, for that. Uh, there was a time when uh, it, the Italian uh, political message on women uh, was uh, particularly inappropriate. Um, but that kind of work reflects or has to work with the um, with the rest of society. What do I mean? Uh, I, I think this is not only in Italy. I think it's more or less worldwide. You have on one side the impression that society is much more ahead <coughs> than politics and institutions. On the other side, um, there is a tendency uh, still of seeing participation of women at the highest level as something strange. If you see universities, um, journalists, 
with some very good exception, um, think tanks, um, economy, if you see the boards, if you see the CEOs, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, so I don't think it's only an issue for politics and institutions, it's an issue for, for society. Obviously politics has a major responsibility because it passes a message. And one thing is passing the message that women should stay home and cook, and one message is that women can be Minister of Defence. So it's, it's not the way of solving all the problems. We know that having half women in government doesn't solve immediately the problem of women in, in power. Uh, if I can use this expression, that is quite blunt. Uh, but it gives uh, uh, the contribution of the political responsibility in trying to change the culture of the country. Uh, so it's one step. And if I can add to that, uh, we have an international issue there uh, on women in foreign affairs and diplomacy. Uh, you've had uh, uh, great <laughs> um, Madam Secretaries, and, uh, and one of the first ones, I think, um, in Europe at the moment, uh, apart from uh, Lady Ashton, obviously, uh, out of 28, it's only two women uh, being foreign ministers, mm. uh, Italy and Croatia. Um, mm. It's, I mean, probably if you look at other uh, ministers, might be the same. It's not, uh, it's not the relevant issue, but it's a sign. And uh, I think uh, we should work to, uh, to, to network and to, to show a little bit more, uh, also because there might be a different attitude in, in facing uh, international relations and crisis management, probably. Is there another question? Okay, in that case, yeah. I'm going to ask you. Oh, do you have a, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, Would you introduce Given the turmoil in Africa, where Italy has a significant stake, uh, do you see any courses of action which uh, offer promise? In all of Africa? Well, what can we do to uh, deal with that effectively? All of Africa. And How much time do we have? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, this, is, this can be a very short or very long question uh, or answer. Um, you know, Nigeria. I would, I, would, well, I would mention Nigeria and I would also mention Sudan as we have this, uh, this news yesterday of this uh, girl uh, that was um, sentenced to death uh, because she changed... Uh, 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 she converted to, uh, to Catholic uh, religion. I don't know if that is an issue in, in uh, but, but that was a news in uh, in the Italian major major news in the Italian um, press uh, and TV uh, in these days. And I think, uh, and then we have obviously the case of the of the more than two hundred girls um, in Nigeria, uh, and these are key issues uh, that concern on one side the issue of that penalty uh, and uh, uh, today I will uh, also discuss that with Ban Ki-moon uh, later during the day because Italy during its presidency is going to uh, work on, uh, on our traditional standing uh, for that penalty moratorium uh, for the next UN General Assembly uh, as a president of the European Union and we're working on that uh, but I'll uh, we have an issue of respect of human rights, of promotion of human rights, I would say, because we too often have double standards. Uh, and that makes us l much less credible when we deal uh, with the effects of uh, violations of human rights uh, when they happen somewhere else from, than from our places. Uh, but we have, um, I think that we have underestimated the potential uh, of Africa and seen Africa only as a place for of conflicts and uh, and and uh, diseases and uh, uh, problems, uh, while it's actually potentially a continent of huge development socially, economically. Uh, it's young. I think it's the youngest continent mm -hmm. uh, in the world. Um, and we risk to uh, have an attitude towards Africa similar to the one that we had uh, uh, with Northern Africa when we didn't see what was happening 
and then f suddenly the Arab Springs came out. Uh, there might be uh, trends in, in, in Africa that uh, could surprise us at a certain point, and we're not just not seeing them. Then we have to work on, on the conflicts in Africa, mm -hmm. many conf different many conflicts in Africa, uh, and on their roots, on their deep roots. Uh, my concern is always that we, uh, we, tend to, uh, we tend to concentrate on things that happen right here, right now, and we don't look where they come from and where they're going. Uh, and this is uh, preventing us from preventing further conflicts in the, in the, coming, in the coming months and, or years or decades. And sometimes the things that you do to tackle the issues that happen right here and right now have negative consequences or might have not positive consequences on the things that would happen probably in a couple of years in other connected parts of the region. And my impression is that in Africa we've had a similar uh, kind of, uh, uh, of problematic approach. Not seeing, uh, let's say, not, not putting in place a coherent uh, global strategy uh, on uh, for the for encouraging the positive developments or the positive movements uh, that can happen in uh, in there. Well, Minister, I think we all want to thank you and uh, thank you. For thank you terrific much. performance. Thank you very and much. I hope you'll return many times to the I council. Will, sure. I will. And I hope your visit to America was very successful. It was. Thank you very much.